And it is the day of the African child, of course, celebrated June, every 16th of June, that is every year, uh, since 1991, when it was first initiated by the Organization of African Unity in honors to those participated in the Soweto uprising in 1976. And now it's time for us to delve deep into this conversation as we celebrate the African child. But our main focus uh, this morning will be centered around child <coughs> abuse and gender-based violence during this COVID-19 period and how kids can access justice from the justice system in Kenya. Remember the theme, uh, this year's theme is... Um, uh, of course, the campaign it was ensuring that uh, there is access to justice for the African child. That is a child-friendly justice system in Africa. And uh, we'll be delving deeper into understanding how best the children are dealing with this particular time and how best the parents are bracing themselves <laughs> to ensure that they are well protected. Michael Gaido is joining me this beautiful morning. Good morning, sir. Uh, good morning. Good yes, morning. Yes, Michael, Michael Gaither is the senior program officer at the GBVLVC TEL. Uh, thank you so much for finding time to be with us. Thank this you. is LVCT Health, right? Yes, LVCT Health. Yes, what does that mean? Uh, uh, this is one of the NGOs locally here in Kenya, mm -hmm. uh, actually uh, tasked with the responsibilities of addressing issues to do with the HIV. Mm -hmm prevention, care, and treatment. Yeah. So basically, we provide those services, you know, like the VCT services. But actually, uh, uh, the other side of it is that we have many other programs, including uh, GBV programs, right. uh, those that actually look at violence against children mm -hmm. and many other forms of violence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so last that's uh, year. LVCT. All right. Yeah. Thank you so much. Now, yeah. last year, 963 children were abused from January to December. These are reports that have been projected. And as of today, we are talking about children abused between January to May, standing at 510. Notable abuse cases, of course, child labor, child abduction, child abandonment, emotional abuse, child marriage, child trafficking, and lawful confi confinement or confinement, sorry, female genital mutilation. And all this, you know, online child abuse, now that we are at that point of, of course, uh, digital life. What do you make of these projections? Are the numbers, you know, on the rise? Are they, you know, okay, well, probably we should be talking about zeroing this. Yeah. Uh, actually, uh, I will tell you something. And, and I like the fact that uh, all of us are alive to the fact that uh, we are in very uh, tricky situations mm -hmm. of COVID-19. Uh, these situations mean that actually people within the families, within the households, are actually staying together as families, including the parents right. and the children. So projections, in fact projections as of around um, April, mm -hmm. UNFPA had projected that if we go into lockdowns and these cessations and restrictions for a period of more than three months, mm -hmm. we'll be seeing figures of more than 15 million globally of gender-based violence. Yeah. Uh, in fact, Father, they had said, if you go beyond six months, we'll be seeing figures of above 31 million mm -hmm. globally. What does that mean here in Kenya? Right. We are talking about a pandemic that is already existing, that is COVID-19. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, we have a shadow pandemic of gender-based violence, mm -hmm. meaning that the cases of GBV and violence against children are now on the rise. But why on the rise amid all these efforts that have been put to tame this? One. That's what a is very it that we're not doing right? Yes. One, that's a very good question. I just mentioned that the situation where we are in now, children who are living within the households with their parents, uncles, and, uh, and what have you, actually are being violated because, one, they are living in scenarios where it, they, are, they are easy targets for violence. Mm -hmm. They are easy targets for violence in the communities as well. Uh, in some of the programs that we as LVCT uh, conduct, we realize that high numbers of children are being violated by their parents, mm. by their uncles, you know, those immediate relatives that they stay with in, right. in their households. Mm -hmm. Because this is the time that, that, that the parent will identify that actually the child, you know, has done something bad. They will be beaten. Mm -hmm. This is the time that they, ha they stay during the curfews with those potential perpetrators they will be sexually violated 
those children out there who will be in the community with community members who have, you know, who, who you know, tension is high, mental health issues are very high. Mm -hmm. And then what happens is that they are likely to be violated because of those situations that I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. so, so actually, there are triggers. There are, let, let me give you an example. FGM is one of, and I, and I like it that you just mentioned in the introduction, yeah. is one of the actual, you know, the, the forms of violence that are occasioned to children. Mm -hmm. What is happening right now? Because the government is not reaching out down to Mashinani, so what happens is that the, the cutters or the, the people who, who, you know, who, who cut the, the girls mm -hmm. are actually b very busy at the, at the lower level of the community, mm -hmm. actually moving, moving these you know, acts very fast to the extent that we might not be able to realize. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, uh, this is an opportunity where people are living in poverty situations because there's no job, you know. Um, you know, the, 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 you know the, the income has reduced. So what happens is that it's very easy for a parent or a guardian to sell off the girl. Right. And selling off the girl, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. It's actually a form of violence. violence. But now, homes are supposed to be the safest grounds. But this time around, they are clearly not. I mean, what are we telling our children? Where do we place them? How do we ensure that they are well secured if the home space, again, is the toughest place and is not the best place for them? It's actually a, it's actually a very dangerous situation as we talk. And as, I've, as you have really observed, that uh, it's one of the safest places for, for, for children to belong and for children to be happy with their parents now that they are their home. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, it's, it's now an opportunity for us to actually sensitize these parents, to sensitize their guardians and actually to inform them of the dangerous situations that they are likely to put these children into. Mm -hmm. A child being violated today because of violence, either sexual or whatever form of violence, mm -hmm. is likely to become a perpetrator of violence in future, okay, in future. if we don't take care of them today. All right. Taking care would mean detecting this at an early stage. So how best can parents and, uh, you know, guardians detect this amid all these fears? Sometimes there's fear to speak out. There's, uh, there's so much stigmatization that it revolves around that, that, you know, they would continue suffering in silence. Sure. Uh, I will tell you, uh, any time that uh, we think about uh, violence against children, mm -hmm. there are things we call the telltale signs. All right the telltale signs. Okay. Those indicators that tell you that this child is undergoing violence. Mm. This child could be, you know, could, could have attained certain behaviors. Yeah. You know, could have attained certain ways of engaging with their parents. Mm -hmm. One, this child could have been, could, could start becoming, you know, silent. You know, they start... Uh, having behaviors that are, you know, uh, very aggressive. Mm -hmm. Sometimes these are ch children who previously, maybe they were not even wetting the bed. Mm. But right now, you could tell that there's something happening. Your child is now starting to wet the bed. Mm -hmm. These are child who may want, you know, to stay away from other children while the other children are mingling, mm. meaning that there could be something wrong with this child. It could be even physical appearance in terms of uh, a child who ma maybe has you know, difficulties in walking, and you can tell maybe that child, you know, is undergoing something. Mm -hmm. A child who, who is even maybe having difficulties in feeding, a child who was very well feeding, a good feeder, mm -hmm. now changes to either being a slow feeder or refuses completely mm -hmm. to eat. That child who may even be, you know, be startled, you know, startled by even just a drop of the spoon, and they become so anxious, right. they become so, you know, mentally, you know, anxious and so forth. Mm. Those are some of the key indicators, among many others, mm -hmm. that I can tell you that actually this child must be undergoing something. Mm -hmm. So you as a parent, you as a care caregiver, mm -hmm. you actually need to actually interact with this child, uh, make sure that you don't, you know, you don't push them further to tell you, have better conversations and dialogue with this child. Right. And from that, you, you're likely to pick those aspects or those things that are actually uh, uh, happening to the child in terms mm -hmm. of violence. What happens if the perpetrator is the parent and guardian, like you had started by saying? Actually, that, that, that's a big challenge. Right. That's a big challenge. The other day in, 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 in one of the media houses, we, mm -hmm. saw, we saw a child who was actually brutally, you know, 
you know brutally you know like i would uh, like close to massacre mm -hmm. a, a child who was even part of the ear was cut off and uh, the back was like you know like, like a truck mm -hmm. where you see the caterpillars walking that child was living with the uncle together in the house yeah. what happens we say it's it's actually difficult sometimes for you to one to know that it's happening within the, the, the homesteads mm -hmm. and number two to actually go for the rescue of this child but what we are saying is that uh, this perpetrator must be removed from this uh, uh, from these scenarios mm -hmm. one if we can be able to remove this child for this from this abusive relationship right. or this abusive family the better the perpetrator must be taken care of in terms of the you know the, the, the judicial processes mm -hmm. that are there to make sure that we you know you take charges against this perpetrator mm -hmm. so could that also be informing or could be part of the modes of intervention and you know the, the the emergency responses that one would incorporate towards ensuring that this child is protected absolutely yeah mm -hmm. rescue and what more others could yeah rescue of this child is one of those emergency aspects that that must be considered right because children who are undergoing violence must be removed as i said earlier mm -hmm. number two um, to make sure that these emergency uh, scenarios are taken mm -hmm. care of we always must be able to have prior information to the people who are concerned including mm -hmm. the caregivers because there, there are those caregivers that are not abusive there are those caregivers it could be the uncles it could be the parents sisters and so forth or brothers mm -hmm. who must be informed in terms of prevention mechanisms for violence mm -hmm. or any information that must be able to prevent the occurrences of this uh, violence uh, then it would be important to to let them know that there are those rescue numbers that they you know the hotlines mm -hmm. that they can always run to that they can always call like say for example usually talk about uh, uh, 116 as mm -hmm. the child helpline helpline yeah yeah and that is one of the emergency routes that the child can call mm -hmm. if that number fails this child can call a national GBV hotline, right. that is 1195. Mm -hmm. And when they call 1195, these children actually can be assisted and the matters can be addressed. Mm. The other thing in terms of emergency response, we usually see that, especially when there's, it's a case of sexual violence, right. this child is likely to have possibly be infected with, you know, either HIV or number two, sexually transmitted infections yeah. or number three uh, chances are that if they are at the age of you know mm -hmm. menac or when they have started uh, seeing their menstruation they are likely to you know to to you know to, uh, to have pregnancies mm -hmm. so what are we saying they must be taken to the hospital within 72 hours mm -hmm. and for them to be taken to the hospital within 72 hours it's for the purposes of giving them treatment you know prevention right you know early treatment early prevention treatment mm -hmm. prophylaxis against you know th those aspects that i've just spoken about police services must come in handy anytime all right we usually talk about at the community level as having the children officers mm -hmm. and, the, and the children volunteer officers that are living within the community that work hand in hand with the national government mm -hmm. you know and, and administrators officers mm -hmm. whom we call ngao they work with them at the community level to make sure that these children are evacuated from an abusive relationship and taken you know, for, for safety, right. for safe houses and so forth. Mm -hmm. yes. All right. Uh, you mentioned the judicial systems, which are also key because some of these cases will land at the hands of the law. So how can they be able to access the justice system, looking at how tough, of course, times have been in, uh, you know, towards ensuring that people get justice, you know, justice has been delayed for the longest of time. We have numerous cases of children who've been defiled, but still they go round and round. Sometimes the perpetrator has led to go scot-free. Uh, one thing that you realize, and I, I, li I like uh, what you just mentioned, is yeah. that uh, this here, the theme, is actually, the theme for Day of the African Child mm -hmm. is actually centering around, you know, access to justice is, yeah. or how best we can make sure that the judicial services for these children mm -hmm. are strengthened, are fast-tracked, right. are accessible, and are expedited 
to the extent mm -hmm. where these children access service to the best uh, timings possible. Yeah. What am I talking about? First of all, uh, let me take you back a little bit. Mm. When you're talking about children, not all children... Okay, sometimes we talk about children, one, in conflict with the law. Mm. Okay? Yes. And these are children who either have been alleged to be, you know, to have, you know, done some uh, error somewhere. Mm -hmm. Number two, these are children who are in contact with the law. In contact with the law in the sense that uh, either they have been dragged into the case because it's a land matter, it's a divorce matter with the parents, it's a separation matter, you know, all those. So yeah. either a child in conflict with the law or a child in contact, in contact. with the law. Yeah. So what happens, there must be mechanisms to ensure that these children either access justice and so forth. Number one, mm -hmm. for them to access, for them to, to ensure that they are able to, to access justice, we must be able to make sure that we approach them in child friendly human rights based approaches okay you know that we are we apply an aspect of human rights okay. when we are we are dealing with, with these them. children mm -hmm. number two is that we must be able to ensure that we look or in, or we factor the four fundamental rights or the key rights that are mm -hmm. enshrined within the within the convention on the rights of the child you know uh, and one we usually talk about and very keen to talk about is actually the, the, the right to life. Yeah. That these children must be accorded the right to life mm -hmm. as enshrined within Article 2 of, of that convention that I've just alluded to. Mm -hmm. That this child must be treated with the best interest, you know, that the best interest of a child must be seen any time. Yeah. Any time that they, ha they are either in, the con in conf conflict with the law or in contact with the law, that the best interest must be brought out, you know, in accordance with Article 3 of the same convention that I've just mentioned. Mm -hmm. then, right. oh, yeah. then, then, then the, the, the other two that I'll just quickly mention is that those children have a right to, you know, survival. Yeah. You know? They, they have a right to participate in any processes. So by, doing, by making sure that you take care of those four elements and actually the human mm -hmm. rights based approaches, you will be able to ensure that these children are able to participate, you know, actively mm -hmm. and the justice systems can be taken care of to ensure that the children are on board mm -hmm. anytime. Right. What you'll realize with our law, our, our, law uh, our laws in Kenya actually ensure that any children matters mm -hmm. that are before the court, that are before the magistrate court, you know those lower courts, yeah. that are before the magistrate court, that it is expedited within a mm -hmm. period of six months, okay. but not anything beyond you know, six months. Mm -hmm. And also re you realize like a Sometimes back, the Chief Justice actually ensured that every 3rd of November, we expedite all cases of children mm -hmm. to make sure that they access justice and they are served with justice as required. Mm -hmm. All right, interestingly, we've seen bills being, of course, tabled and debated to a point of becoming law in the best interest of the children. We're talking about what is enshrined in the 2010 Constitution that is a provision of section 53 of the constitution has captured all issues from the united nations convention of the rights of children and the african charter and much much more so some of the uh, what are some of the gains that we have made so far in regards to matters child protection uh, even as we you know continue to uh, document or uh, report on these terrible cases that are still ongoing I just alluded to a few in my yes, previous in, conversation. Yes, in your previous yes. And I just mentioned that uh, that, that at the moment, cases of uh, uh, child-related cases are fast tracked in, in 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 the in the court systems. Mm. Actually, you realize even in some courts they have identified specific courts that address children matters. Yes, you know, uh, th those are quite good gains. As mm -hmm. we talk right now, we have a we have a children's a bill, mm. you know, children's bill of uh, 2018 yeah. uh, that is before the house and actually uh, it's, it's waiting a few steps uh, to make sure that it becomes an act of parliament. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and within that bill, there are so many nice things that are said within, you know, the bill itself. Yeah. Uh, and and, and that's, a, that's a great mi mi milestone. You'll also realize that uh, for the second time uh, in 2019, 
uh, Kenya has conducted a national survey, mm -hmm. which is known as Violence Against uh, Children Survey, VAC mm -hmm. Survey 2019. I know it's likely to, it's likely to be to be to be launched this month. Mm -hmm. The dates I don't I, I wouldn't uh, con confirm the specific dates, mm -hmm. and and we, it's within this service that we get to, to understand the experiences of children, mm -hmm. the experiences of children in terms of even of violence. And the numbers that we keep on saying and the numbers that we keep on witnessing. Uh, and out of that, the, 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 the charged department of children's services actually is able to come up with national plans that set out of an agenda, an agenda on how to address those challenges, those mm -hmm. gaps, you know, across all sectors. It's, it's, we, we've, we've, we've come across so many gains in terms of uh, multi-agencies and multi-stakeholders working together yeah. to ensure actually that uh, children rights, children issues are taken care of. Uh, right. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Uh, what are some of the challenges that, uh, you know, in a way, that is within the system that in a way uh, impede the dispensation of justice for these children? Uh, First of all, I'll, I'll just mention a quick one that yeah. is not uh, within the system. Right. Uh, one would be where issues of children are taken, people want to take issues of children out of court. Okay. And especially when children have been violated. And as you can tell, cases of sexual violence, according to the Sexual Offences Act, mm -hmm. are cases that can never be handled out of court. Yeah. That you are aware of. Uh, so you realize that in so many scenarios, people want to, ha to, you know, to adapt kangaroo courts. Yeah. You know, that's a challenge. People want to ensure that uh, these cases do not get to the light of the day mm -hmm. or uh, don't see the light of the day in the, in the courts. Mm -hmm. So that's one, one challenge out of the system. The other challenge is now within the system mm -hmm. would be either lack of you know, knowledge for some of the you know, uh, duty bearers, uh, and especially to an extent where some of these duty bearers do not understand clearly, mm -hmm. you know, the, the provisions either of the law yeah. or the guidelines and so forth, or any protocols. Mm -hmm. So what happens is that we ensure from where, we, from where I come from that they are, in, they are capacitated, mm -hmm. that we strengthen their ability to respond or to be able to identify these children who are being violated and fast track to, to access services. Mm -hmm. uh, number two, it could be in terms of uh, the aspect of the service prov provision, you know, that process itself. And especially like now, let's talk about the COVID-19 scenario, where many of, 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 the, of the courts were, you know, like on stand down, mm -hmm. you know, had go gone down in terms of cases. cases so yeah. you realize that in one or the other, the systems m could not accommodate for many cases to be, you know, to be prosecuted within yeah. the court, mm -hmm. okay. So, so that's that's another challenge. Right. Uh, I, I know, I know that there is this scenario out there about the, you know, the nomination of the forty-one judges mm -hmm. and so forth out there. Mm -hmm. It might not, it might be neither here nor there because uh, you're talking about the high court judges, mm -hmm. and we realize that these cases are prosecuted within the lower courts. So that means there shouldn't be any challenges whatsoever. Right. But if we, if we can ensure that we dedicate courts, children's courts that are able to fast track, mm -hmm. you know, some of these children issues, that would be a plus, you know, for, for children to access justice. Okay. Yeah. So what are the possible solutions? What could you project as possible solutions uh, that we can bring in place uh, to counter the emerging issues that affect children and also those ones that have been in existence for the longest of time, apart from these judicial ways that we are talking about, new ones. Because then, like we started by saying that, you know, the numbers continue on the rise. Abuse of children is on the rise. It's a clear indication that maybe there's something that we're not doing right. Maybe we should try other means. Right. I think it all starts from top, bottom, uh, in this scenario. Yeah. where uh, proper policies, proper legislations must be put in place, mm -hmm. proper legal frameworks must be put in place, proper guidelines must be put in place to start with. That is one. Number two, mm -hmm. there is having those items in place and there is enforcement yes. of those items, as I've mentioned. If we enforce clearly what is out there in terms of policies or guidelines mm -hmm. or frameworks, then we are good to go. 
So number one, enforcement. Mm -hmm. And number two is making sure that we fast track some of the pending bills. I've just, I've just alluded to the uh, children's bill of 2018. If we're able to fast track this bill out yeah. there, mm -hmm. then we'll have lots of solutions in terms of what you're, to you're talking about because it pre prescribes so many important aspects in terms of uh, child protection mm -hmm. and, and so forth. Mm -hmm. Number three, in terms of uh, strengthening those systems out there, including the judicial systems, either at the community level for, for us to be able to identify these, these children faster, to have uh, you know, uh, those people working in the community, including volunteer children officers, and the children officers are themselves working at the community, mm -hmm. that they have proper capacity and tools to be able to fast track case, cases of child uh, abuse, abuse in the community yeah. right. and to make sure that children receive child protection at their community level. Mm -hmm. So two ways. One, at the, at the, at the duty bearers level, mm -hmm. to make sure that these duty bearers have what it takes to ensure that they provide the rights mm -hmm. to the duty bearers right. who are the children out there, who are the mothers out there in, the, in, in that community or who are the guardians out there in that community. All right. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Michael Gaido. But before I let go of you, what uh, should uh, the public know? Or what would be this message that you have for the public in regards to celebrating the Day of the African Child? One thing that uh, the public must know out there is that uh, uh, the children out there, they require protection, mm -hmm. they require care, they require love, understanding, these children require to be involved in all aspects of, uh, you know, aspects of uh, care, family life, and so forth, uh, for them to be able to celebrate this day. This is their day. This being their day, and I like how you started it, mm -hmm. that uh, hundreds of children were massacred in Soweto in 1976. You know, yeah. just because they were crying for their rights, just because they were crying to be equals in education. Mm -hmm in education because of apartheid. Now here in Kenya, you're talking about systems where today there's that child out there who today is not equal in education because mm -hmm. today we are in the system of you know the virtual learning. Yeah. And another child out there in a very remote setting does not have access to the same learning platform. Mm. So what are we saying is that on one hand to the to the to the caregivers and the uh, and the members of the family uh, let's work hand in hand with the children. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, to the policy makers and the duty bearers, yeah. that it is our time to make sure that we embrace a human rights based approach to all children in Kenya. Mm -hmm. And number two, that we do not discriminate, that we apply non discriminatory approaches mm -hmm. when we are handling these children yes, right. in Kenya. All right. Yeah. Thank you so much, Asai. It was great having you this morning. And as we celebrate this day, we call upon everyone to ensure that we make the world a safe space for the children out there. My guest, Michael Gaido, Senior Program Officer, that is GBVLVCT Health. It was great having you this morning. I hope we've captured all that there needs to be uh, captured or there is need to capture at this particular time. We'll be having more sessions on this and I'm sure we're going to have coverage on how the country is celebrating and also the global fraternity is celebrating the world of the African child, or the day of the African child. We take a short break. We'll be coming with a, a different uh, conversation altogether on Masa's Pastries. If you are that person who would have loved to know how to bake, how to get creative, especially at this time when, you know, people are at home, COVID-19 pandemic is here and you're being told just get creative.